and and begin. Um, as I've mentioned, if you haven't already, please tell us who you are and where you're joining from. And uh, in particular, how you're using or planning to use Roar. I have already heard some great news from Arthur Smith of the American Physical Society that uh, they're going to be sending Roar IDs to Crossref, which is wonderful. Um, we always like that. Um, just a few housekeeping notes about the call. Um, it, here's our agenda for today. Uh, we're going to give you just a, a few brief updates. Uh, Liz Krasnarich, our technical lead, will tell you um, what's been going on with Roar Tech, especially um, the planned launch of version two of the Roar metadata schema and API. We're going to hear um, a few curation updates, including uh, a report on a project that we've done to uh, improve our coverage of Chinese organizations. And we'll hear from our leading fellow, Jackson Huang, about that. I'll give you a few updates on um, what's going on with Roar Adoption and um, uh, a bit about uh, some community management uh, initiatives we're undertaking. And then we're going to hear from Fabienne Michaud uh, of Crossref about, uh, with just a few updates on the ongoing transition um, from the open funder registry to Roar as a standard funder identifier. And then we'll have uh, hopefully plenty of time for questions at the end. If you're just joining us for the first time, um, you should know uh, certain things about these calls. We hold them every other month. So the next one will be near the end of May. Um, we generally just tell you uh, what's going on with Roar, um, new developments, new adoptions, what we've been doing for the last couple of months and raise some topics that we need community feedback on. And often we do have uh, Roar integrators um, doing demonstrations of what, uh, how they've integrated Roar into their systems, which is always really nice. We announce them via our community mailing list and we put them on our events webpage and usually put them on social media as well. Um, so if you are uh, not uh, part of our community mailing list, you can write us at info at roar.org to be added to that list. Anyone is uh, free to join. And we encourage you to participate. These are always meetings, not webinars. Um, so you can certainly uh, ask questions in the chat. Um, the Roar team will be here to answer those. Um, and in fact, in our Q&A period, you can raise your hand and just begin talking. Um, we encourage that. We do record the calls. The calls are being recorded right now, as you likely noticed. And we do publish the recordings on our YouTube channel and also post the slides on our events page. Uh, if you'd like to get involved beyond these calls, uh, you can always submit feature requests or bug reports on GitHub, um, post questions and share information in our discussion channels. Um, and then uh, you can always um, cor help correct our records. Uh, you can submit a curation request for a new record or a correction to existing records. Um, we are very active in that regard. Uh, always love more involvement in that. And then of course, you can always tell us about how you're using or planning to use Roar. And of course, in these calls as well, and as I'll show you later, we have a, a special forum where you can tell us even more detail about, about your integration. And if you're interested in doing a, some kind of in-depth case study, um, you can always contact us again at info at roar.org or community at roar.org. And um, we'd be happy to um, talk with you more about your use of Roar and uh, perhaps uh, offer you a slot on one of our calls to show off and demo your integration. Okay, so now we're just gonna get started with um, just a couple of um, things that have happened uh, since the um, annual meeting, which we had at the end of January. All the recordings and slides from those great sessions are again available on roar.org slash events. Um, there's not that much that's been going on. It's been sort of a uh, business as usual, but we are planning to be uh, at a couple of upcoming conferences this year. Um, so for those of you who are users of the open journal systems or who are involved with OJS in any way, um, you may be aware that the Public Knowledge Project, which produces that software, often holds uh, community sprints, which, some, which can involve software development, but can also include things like documentation, uh, and so on. And so we're involved for, uh, with those 
um, with a, an, an upcoming PKP sprint, which is happening as a sort of a, a before the library publishing forum in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, so if anybody is going to be attending that, um, again, please let us know in the chat. I uh, would love to connect with you there. Um, I'll be there for both the, um, uh, the sprint and then as well at a pre-conference panel, which is talking about uh, general open science collaboration. So we'll be in Minneapolis in May. Um, then Howard Ratner is here from Chorus and Chorus is um, organizing a, a forum uh, also in May, near the end of May on uh, the future of persistent identifiers in scholarly publishing. That's an online event, so anyone can join. And then two, uh, we'll be at the Society for Scholarly Publishing in Boston, which is, of course, a really big event where a lot of publishers are going to be. Um, so that's at the end of May, and we'll be happy to connect with you there. Um, all the registration information for those, or at least links to where you can get to other registration information are on our events page. Um, so visit that page to uh, see more details about that and sign up. Okay, we're going to hear now from Liz Krasnarich, our technical lead, about what's been going on in her neck of the woods. Liz? Thanks, Amanda. And there's been so much going on from the uh, technical side of ROAR. Um, so for those who are, are new to this meeting or haven't been following along, um, uh, for about the last year and a half, we have been working on a major update to ROAR's data model and, and API. So the first major revision to the, to the schema, um, this started with, a, uh, with defining the versioning process for ROAR um, and gaining community feedback on just that process, how we were going to number versions and sunset timelines and things like that. And then we, um, created a draft proposal for the schema changes that went through multiple rounds of community feedback um, last year. And that resulted in a finalized proposal for the schema changes. And then at that point, we could finally get down to work on the technical implementation. There was a beta test that was run back in September. And uh, as of now, we are finally just about ready to, uh, to release everything to production and to start curating records using version two. So can we switch to the next slide, please? Um, and our first production release that is V2 first, as in we're actually creating new, up, new records and updating records using version two, we're planning roughly for early April. We're aiming for, I think, the week of the 10th or 10th and 11th of April. We're um, doing our dress rehearsal this week and making sure that everything that we've tested is still working as expected. Um, and what will happen at that point is that um, the raw data, all of it, will be available in version two and version one through the API and in the data dumps. So for folks using the data dump, um, the data dump currently contains two files. There's a JSON file and a CSV file. Um, it will contain four files. Um, this should not be a really breaking change for current dump users. The uh, V1 files will continue to have the same naming structure as will the data dump zip file. There will be two additional files that will have um, a schema V2 indicator appended to the end of their end of their name. So four files instead of two there. And then in the API, we're introducing versioning in the path portion of the API. However, um, we will still be serving uh, the unversioned uh, API endpoint as well. The default will still be version one um, as part of our sunset plan. Um, that default uh, version one will still be supported for at least a year, and that default won't change until that point. Um, a not so well kept secret that we have is that the record data has actually been available in the production API to read in version two um, since uh, this, this fall. So you can actually go look at that right now and see what the record structure is going to look like. Um, so this shouldn't break anyone immediately. It's just that um, we'll be doing V2 first curation and everything will now be available in version two. Um, so we'll have lots more updates and announcements about exactly when that happens, but it is coming in the next couple of weeks. Um, to look 
more in detail at a couple of the changes. Let's uh, take a look at the next slide. So this is a major change. Um, we wanted to uh, take this opportunity to really take a look at the version that we inherited from GRID, um, look at the feedback we've received and what's happened through our curation process over uh, the couple of years since Roar started independent curation and take this opportunity to make like one really big set of changes. And hopefully in the future, we'll be looking at making much smaller changes. So on the left, this is just a preview of what um, the field structure for a version two record will look like um, at a high level. And on the right is what um, you'll see in the data dump zip file inside of it um, if you download that. So looking at a few key fields that have changed, um, let's take a look at the next slide. Um, a big feature that we have added, which was sorely lacking from the previous records, was dates. Uh, we didn't have created and less modified dates in the records, and we now, in version two, support that. And in fact, we have gone back and pulled out the created and less modified dates from all the previous uh, grid and roar dumps and put in the actual dates that correspond um, to those historical created and less modified dates. So very exciting. You can now query for records by date and get records that have been created or modified in a specific range. Next slide, please. Um, the structure of several fields has changed to uh, make these fields more flexible to, um, in many cases, support uh, multilingual functionality. And the one that will probably affect the most users, since everybody, almost everybody is looking for names that correspond to ROAR IDs, is the names field. Uh, the current uh, ROAR data model has four different fields that contain different types of names associated with an organization. These are all being rolled into one names field and the structure of the items in those fields is, or that field is being standardized to a types value kind of structure. So um, we are moving uh, the separate fields, aliases, labels, name and acronyms. Um, those indicators are being, being moved into a types field. All name types will support a language code. Currently only the labels um, field supports language code, and we've had a lot of demand for supporting language codes for all types. Um, we will uh, be backfilling uh, language codes for existing records once we get the release out the door. So new records and updated records, you're going to start seeing more language codes. And then over time, you'll see language codes backfilled into many more names. Next slide. Another field where there are pretty big changes is the addresses field that has actually changed its name to locations to better reflect what's actually in there. Um, the current data model has location information in a few different fields, addresses, and then there is a separate um, country field that duplicated some of the data that was already in addresses. So those are being combined into one and then um, the current addresses field has a huge amount of very detailed data from geo names that we learned that a lot of people were not using that uh, at all. And it was difficult to keep that updated and in sync with geo names. And if you really, really need that level of detail um, in your location information, uh, it's easy to go and retrieve that from the geo names API. Um, Oh, I'm sorry about the uh, the images overlapping. The first line is just stating that addresses and country field are being condensed into the locations field. Um, so we're simplifying the amount of location information that is included. You can see what will be included um, on the right. We'll still have country, country code, country name, latitude, longitude. Um, the name, which is a city name in most cases for organizations that are in a city, but some of them are not in a city, so it might be a broader location. And then the GeoNames ID, if you do want to go and retrieve uh, additional information. Um, we're also introducing 
uh, the ability to support multiple locations for a given organization with the caveat that this is intended for some pretty unique cases where an organization fully exists in two locations. This isn't intended for documenting all of the satellite locations um, where an organization might have offices or sub entities. Um, but this field is actually, the addresses field is actually an array right now. It's just that nothing has multiple locations. And in the future, you may actually see multiple uh, address or multiple locations on a single record. Uh, next slide. So we do have uh, documentation uh, up on the website for the schema for the data model of V2. And you can go back and look at all of the documents that were related to the proposal and the feedback on, um, on these changes. Um, we will be adding more documentation before the launch date, um, as well as a, a kind of detailed list of change log for the, the API changes, um, and we'll be making lots of announcements with fanfare. So look out for that in the, in the coming weeks. Thank you, Liz. Yeah, I see a bunch of questions in the chat, so I will answer, answer those and we can uh, continue on with the rest of the meeting. Yep. Thanks so much. Okay, we have a few curation updates. Um, I think we're starting with Adam. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, just a few brief updates from me on Roar Curation. Next slide, please. So following from what Liz described in her technical updates, we have also uh, rewritten and improved our entire curation pipeline to support the new schema. This includes things like uh, improved triaging of requests to better identify variant names and external identifier values, improved duplicate de detection of existing records and requests. Um, my personal favorite, automatic translation of free text descriptions of change into record updates using some AI tools. And last, but of course, certainly not least, uh, language tagging for all name metadata and record requests. Uh, once we've switched over to fully curating things in V2, which as Liz mentioned is planned for next month, we will begin work on a few bulk update projects that we have queued up. So of course, um, this includes adding languages for name metadata across the entire data set. We've done some initial testing of that and we think we can do it at about 97% uh, accuracy for about 80% of the names metadata, which we think is a pretty good kind of uh, score. Um, we're also going to be doing some bulk reconciliation of records against Wikidata and ISNI, as well as incorporating variant names from the funder registry. So that's all for me, very brief. Uh, I'm now going to turn things over to Jackson Wong, our newest curation board member and program officer for sustainable digital infrastructure at the Educopia Institute to talk about helping us improve our approach to curating Chinese research organizations in war. Take it away, Jackson. Thank you, Adam. Uh, so I had the pleasure as part of the leading project to work with Adam and Maria over uh, the last half year or so on the second half of 2023. Um, on kind of taking a look at the Chinese record, the organizations for, sorry, the records for Chinese organizations in Roar. Um, can we go ahead to the next slide, please? Um, just when we say, when I say Chinese here, um, we kind of used a proxy by geographic coverage. Um, so Chinese by kind of language in a kind of broad sense of national origin. Um, so we grabbed uh, organizations from the from mainland China, from Taiwan, Singapore, and then also Hong Kong and Macau, which were sometimes listed as separate countries and sometimes as part of mainland China. I think this has a little bit to do with what Liz was saying earlier about um, kind of the difficulty of keeping things fully updated or consistent with um, the 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 geo geo names um, or wherever it was being pulled from um, and. I kind of just to note that um, this is a process that uh, because these places have, even though they kind of speak the same language-ish in an ISO sense, at least, um, there are kind of different language policies between the countries as well as over time. And there's also kind of usage of um, 
other languages as well within those countries. Um, we, for this project, I focused on label coverage specifically um, for searchability and matching um, and kind of made an assessment that for usability, organizations should generally have both simplified and traditional Chinese labels on top of an English name, um, just because of how different systems index or are or are not optimized to kind of index multilingual metadata. Um, and then noting also that they uh, sometimes did or did not have um, additional language languages as well. So either um, because of local language policy or because of, um, yeah, usually, usually because of local language policy, but sometimes because of just certain specific institutional history as well. Um, I noticed, oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I think, um, sorry so much, Jackson. I think Amanda's yeah. having some technical difficulties. So the slide should be back up. Okay, great. Um, I wanted to know as well that um, on top of using multiple names, um, either because of, you know, organizations changing names over time, that's not obviously Chinese language specific, um, but there's a lot of, publishing, especially in STEM and English, but a lot of organizations don't necessarily have official English names. And so there's sort of this issue of wanting to find English names, not only because with the original grid import, the kind of base name was by default in English, but because you do see a lot of actual citation and usage in English, but in the kind of absence of um, like standard formal English names. And so that cross-referencing is both really important, but also kind of um, difficult. Uh, and in a lot of the sources where there are kind of both English and Chinese versions of names like Wikidata, ISNI, or even like Baidu or Wikipedia, um, the data is not, the data is not very um, consistent. So like sometimes you might have both language fields, but I would, it would not generally be you would need a lot of cross-referencing if you were to just do a bulk import of the Chinese and English names. You can't actually use them, but they're just the same. Um, websites are obviously a good bet, um, but with China in particular, there's also a lot of kind of regional IP locking that can make it a little bit challenging to access names, as well as kind of a quirk um, that I think Adam has mentioned that happens with Japanese organizations as well, which is like a preference for choosing um, to have the logo or the name as an image instead of a text file, which can make kind of free text searching a little bit more challenging. Um, and then I wanted to know as well that um, while there is standard romanization for Chinese, uh, it's not particularly useful in that people don't really use it. Um, and also the kind of standard romanization has changed over time, but it's not really harmful to have. So in cases where there was romanization, I was just like, is that correct? Great, but there wasn't really a priority. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and so in this, um, in this kind of landscape, uh, I did two kind of pilot projects. Um, one, which was just a set of kind of remediation and cleanup efforts around educational organizations in Shanghai. Um, this felt like a relatively small group that was a good place to kind of start. Uh, because I had kind of assumed that there would be like fairly good quality records to see if a kind of more automated baseline workflow could be built out. Um, and this was sort of mostly just verifying data, adding variant forms. Um, I think a lot of these records, a lot of these uh, institutions did have records in various places like ISNI or Wikidata. Um, but again, that was sort of the discovery that even for organizations that are in a lot of different um, registries, the quality is not necessarily, uh, it, sh it should be double checked. <laughs> That's how I'll put it. Um, and so we did kind of a batch to just go through them and then um, clean and update those records. Uh, and then the second set was the actually part of all of the work that um, Adam and the rest of the world and the rest of the Roar team have been doing on uh, the import and the kind of merger of the cross refunder records with Roar. Um, so Adam had a list that of unmatched Chinese organizations. Um, and we decided to look at, um, to see if we could kind of manually reconcile the records with at least 1000 citations in Crossref to kind of maximize impact. Um, and this ended up being a very manual process, I think from part of what I was describing earlier about the fact that 
these are organizations, right, that are published under these English names, sometimes very extensively so, but either there aren't formal English names for them or oftentimes there, maybe there is one, but it's like, it's not in a record authority somewhere. It's sort of like a press release at some point that something's released. Um, and there was sort of a lot of duplication that was caused by uh, translations for the same term. So there's like a kind of basic research fund, except that sometimes they'd use the term fundamental or sometimes basic. And if you're reading the Chinese, you can tell that this is clue the same organization. But in English, right, that's not so obvious. And the fact that you see that citation used in different places, it makes it kind of even less obvious. Um, similarly, with terms like key and major. So like, for example, the fundamental research funds for the central universities is actually the same as the National University's Basic Research Foundation of China. Like those words sound kind of like synonyms, but a lot of organizations have similar names. So you can't necessarily assume that they're like, you know, synonyms. Um, and I think this was definitely a case for funding in particular, where the lack of standardized English naming causes challenges, especially because of how extensively these organizations are published in English language journals. I think they didn't have English language names, but they only published in Chinese. This becomes less of an issue, but you have you know very extensive publishing in English, but without English names. Um, and so you know we uh, we set up a workflow to kind of update or consolidate those records where possible. Um, and then kind of coming out of these two projects, uh, in terms of thinking about next steps, um, we decided that it probably makes sense to prioritize, you know, both highly cited records, which feels pretty self-evident, but also um, government organizations, I think, especially in terms of um, if we're merging the Frunder registry into ROAR, that um, for China in particular, there's a lot of government, there's a lot of state funding of research and a lot of kind of citation of state organizations. Um, and there's somewhat consistent, you know, federal, provincial and municipal level organization of government agencies. And so even though there's a relatively small number of government organizations, that that's a really big um, area that would kind of improve the usability and consistency of that data. Um, and then next slide, I just have an example um, of a record that um, came up when we were looking, when I was looking at the Shanghai News pilot. Um, so you see here a, you see, so this is a organization that was just withdrawn um, because of what I realized when kind of trying to reconcile the data that um, you see this organization, if you look in, you know, uh, indexes, like you see this organization listed in this way, you see, you know, it published it, as um, researcher affiliation. But when you look at the Chinese name, um, it's very clear that this is not a standalone institution. So in English, right, it looks like it might be like, maybe like a center that's run between a bunch of different universities in Shanghai or something like that. Um, but in Chinese, it's very clear that it's a sub branch of Zhao Tong Dashu, which is got the English name, but it's a major university in Shanghai and they have a medical school and within their medical school, they have this E Institute for chemical biology, right? And so that's very obvious when you're looking at the original language metadata, but there's sort of this complex process of being able to track down the original language metadata, because even though there is extensive citation in English under this form, like actually being able to cross-reference the English and the Chinese name is quite challenging. So I will go ahead and pass it off to uh, whoever's gonna give adoption and community updates. Yeah, that is uh, me before I met, Oh, so before Amanda does that, I'm just going to hop in and say uh, fantastic insights as always. And we're going to be translating these into some registry updates over the course of the next couple of months, as well as using them to kind of guide our kind of overall policies towards um, curating Chinese organizations. So, um, yeah, that's why we're glad to have Jackson as part of the curation board, especially to kind of help us do a better job with curating these organizations and having the best kind of representation of Chinese research organizations. OK, sorry for interrupting, Amanda. Uh, go on to adoption updates. Um, you bet. Um, one sec. Let me just uh, bring up the slides again. <laughs> I had a, a um, very unexpected internet outage of some kind, but I'm just about there. Okay. Here we go. Okay. 
So I just wanted to give you um, a few updates on what's new in Roar Adoption. Um, probably the biggest news that has come out just in the last month or so is that Web of Science, um, which is of course a, an enormously influential Clarivate product, is planning to integrate Roar. Um, the link here in this slide uh, goes to a blog post that they have updated, um, which is about kind of how they manage um, organizational unification, as they call it. Um, so that is, of course, a, a product that a lot of people use for research tracking and so on. So we think that's that's great news and really huge. Um, we've learned um, again, you know, sometimes we learn about these things belatedly. So I think that this has um, actually been in place for quite a while. But ACM Digital Library, um, the Association for Computing uh, Machinery, um, quite an important organization, has integrated war into its um, system. It's essentially a kind of a repository, preprint repository. Um, a couple of new contributors to uh, um, Crossref metadata that I've noticed, um, and this will sh show up in some of the stats that I'll show you in just a moment. The Inter-American Development Bank, um, which is based in DC, has been uh, doing a great job of assigning DOIs to all of its reports and including RAW IDs, in, in their case, as an institutional affiliation. Um, so I think that's great. I think for a lot of these places where they have a lot of institutionally authored reports, I think they're very happy to be able to connect those all back to that institution. Um, some of you may be aware of Front Matter, which is kind of a um, newish um, consulting type of organization that's run by Martin Rittman. Uh, one of Martin's projects is to um, one of several things that Front Matter does is to assign DOIs to blog posts. And so um, Martin was actually one of the original contributors to Roar, you know, the Roar technology. And so he has been uh, making sure that uh, these DOIs he's beginning to register for blog post contents uh, include Roar. So that's been great. Uh, Adam came up with this, I think, just yesterday or the day before. Um, uh, the Bibliographic Agency for Higher Education in France uh, posted a really nice blog post about um, using ROAR essentially for institutional disambiguation in their systems. Um, it was a really lovely blog post uh, in French, and um, you can find that. Maybe somebody could share the link in the chat. Uh, and then I'm going to show you just a little bit about uh, not exactly a new ROAR adoption, but a new use of ROAR by, of course, one of the most important ROAR users, ORCID. Uh, but before I go on to tell you a little bit about that, I do want to encourage you um, uh, to tell us about your ROAR use, uh, if you haven't already. Some of you have been um, letting us know in the chat about the, that, but um, I'm always really interested to hear about how people are using ROAR um, and whether they're planning to use ROAR or are currently using it. Um, you can tell us more about that um, with this link, uh, bit.ly ROAR integration form. So I was on the ORCID community call um, I think last week, really interested. We had heard a little bit about this, but we really hadn't known that they were quite as far along with this as they as they turned out to be. Um, so what ORCID reported last week is that they have built a new feature uh, that uses Roar. So you, what they're doing is that when people newly sign up for an ORCID, they, are, had, they have a suggest box for that user saying, you know, you're you're using an email that is, you know, Amanda at yorku.edu. Um, therefore, we've taken that domain and matched it to a ROAR ID and an affiliation. And so we are suggesting to you that you are affiliated with the University of York. And I can either say yes or no. And you can see this really huge, huge spike um, just in literally a couple of weeks with new users saying, why yes, ORCID, I am indeed affiliated with the University of York. So um, ORCID has said that they are um, anticipating that this is going to dramatically increase, of course, the, the number of ROAR IDs in their system. Um, so we think that's, that's really exciting. And it's kind of a, it's a, uh, you know, it's not exactly a new use of ROAR because this is still, you know, like, hey, what organization are you affiliated with? But it's really a, it's really nice to see this kind of um, suggestion happening that can improve the percentage of ROAR IDs in ORCID. 
Um, so just some, some quick stats. I'm always tracking how many people are sending RUR IDs uh, to uh, Crossref in DOI metadata. Uh, we heard from Arthur Smith earlier in the call that the APS is planning to do that as well. Uh, we've broken 100,000, which is great. Um, and I always think that this is interesting um, to see, to break it down by type. Um, so for a long time, grants were the most common item type that had RUR IDs because um, the grant registration form in Crossref is RUR enabled, whereas um, some of the other systems for registering DOIs in Crossref are not. Uh, but journal articles have outstripped all the other item types, uh, which is, I think, the way it should be. And we are always anticipating seeing that go way up uh, at the end of the year as more publishers begin to adopt RUR. Um, but you can see here um, this dramatic increase in reports. And I think that this is coming both from Front Matter and from the Inter-American Development Bank. Um, so just in January 2024, we only had about, you know, fewer than 4,000 uh, reports uh, with RUR IDs in the metadata, and now that's up um, sixfold. Um, so that's always very interesting. Plenty of dissertations, lots of repositories are using ROAR, and most of them are, are usually registering DOIs with Datacite, but some of them do register with Crossref as well. Uh, so plenty of dissertations. The peer review are mainly coming from eLife, but other places as well. Uh, in Datacite, um, we have um, what is that? One, you know, nearly 1.7 million um, records with ROAR used as an author affiliation, or again, like that institutional, the institution as author is also captured by this. And then um, I always think this is really interesting. You can't really do this with the Crossref API um, yet. But um, Datacite does accept multiple types of identifiers um, in both affiliation and funder metadata. And so you can see that um, uh, for use in author affiliations or, or institutional authorship, or is by far um, the most commonly used identifier in Datacite metadata, um, over 85% of the uh, affiliations are RUR IDs. And even for funder metadata, of course, um, the funder registry is still the primary funder identifier, um, but there's plenty of plenty of records that are using ROAR to identify funders in data site metadata as well. So nearly 30%. Uh, and then finally, I just wanted to mention uh, um, some upcoming changes. Um, we have um, we've had historically a few different kinds of communication channels, and we always do want to have um, you know, remain in contact with everybody, uh, but we're just working to try to consolidate those a little bit more. And I think especially to use, a, use media that people uh, prefer and allow people to get in touch with one another as well as with us. So we're working to basically centralize and consolidate our communications. So um, the Roar Slack, uh, the Community Advisory Group List, which has been a one-way distribution list, um, the GitHub discussion board that we had and an old RUR adoption group. We're going to consolidate all those into a single email based discussion list um, and announcement list. So you'll get, um, we'll be making this transition over the course of the next couple of months. We will invite you all. Um, I'll go back and uh, for Zoom registrants, for everybody who is a current member of our Slack, for everybody who is on our community advisory group list and probably event at attendees as well, I'll probably send you a single email inviting you to join our new group. And uh, that way um, we can be sure that all of the communications are coming to that one group and you'll be able to sign up yourself um, uh, if you have a Google account. Um, we do uh, already have a Google group for uh, RUR technical users, um, you know, you're free to join both of them either if you like. Um, Liz tends to send, um, you know, very API specific changes to the RUR tech group, so uh, that's a good place to go if you want that kind of um, really nitty gritty information. Um, uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll be able to let you join the group. We do know that especially for government users, uh, US government users, Google can be um, a bit of an issue, but uh, we've uh, conferred with other people and we, you do not have to have a Gmail address or a Google account in order to participate in the group. Uh, it just means that I'll have to add you manually um, instead of you joining yourself, but you'll still be able to join the group and uh, receive email from it and send email to it. Um, so we're planning to shut down the Roar Slack 
uh, about June 1st, but again, we'll be doing lots of comms about this and inviting everybody who's currently in the Slack um, to join the new group, inviting everybody who's on the current community advisory group list to join the new list and all of that. So just a little housekeeping changes. Um, and now we're gonna hear from Fabien Michaud, who is a product manager for the Funder Registry and several other products at Crossref. Fabien? Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Fabienne Michon, the product manager for Similarity Check, the Funder Registry, and I'm coordinating uh, the work we do at Crossref for the Funder Registry war uh, transition. So here's an update uh, from me. So in September, we announced that we were working to bring the Funder Registry and war closer together and uh, that we were going to deprecate the Funder Registry. And uh, we, we don't have a timeline yet for the deprecation of the Funder Registry, but it will be available until at least the end of this year. And I insist on the word at least, or the, the two words at least, um, and it's likely to be available uh, beyond, it's highly likely to be available beyond uh, 2024, uh, because we, we still have a lot of work to do. Um, I'm sure in previous calls, Adam talked about the work um, he did to analyze the Fondo ideas to raw idea uh, mappings and how they were exposed in our APIs. And um, he has even created a tool for everyone to use. And I'll point uh, to it on my next slide. Uh, when, um, and, but, but we're all very, uh, very happy with the result, as you can see from the, uh, from the percentage on the slide. Because we would like this transition to be as smooth as possible, we are consulting with users of the Funder Registry to understand how the community is currently using the Funder Registry and to identify practical challenges in their workflow. So if you'd like to take part, contact the raw team using the email address on this slide. Um, we've also uh, made um, some really good progress on our work to accept raw ideas where we currently accept funder ideas. So once this is ready, we'll announce it and you'll be able to deposit raw ideas in places like in the funding section of the metadata for works. Um, we have a lot of experience at Crossref in matching with citations, for instance, because our members don't always deposit all the identifiers they could deposit. We are planning as part of this project to develop matching strategies for affiliation strings to raw ideas, and this should be ready in the next few months. Um, and for funder matching. So once um, these strategies are developed and we'll make them available for everybody uh, for everybody to use. Again, if you're interested, get in touch with our uh, labs team at Crossref and the email address is um, on the screen. So on the next slide, please, Amanda, um, you um, have a link to our blog post or the latest blog post we we have done at Crossref, so it's a link to the uh, to the blog itself. Uh, but you'll be able to find Rachel Lamy's um, blog post on the the funder registry and raw um, on the on that page. Um, I've also included a link to the facts page that the raw team has created on the funder registry uh, raw transition. Uh, with questions such as, um, will funder ideas continue to resolve? Will the Crossref funder API remain available? The answer to, um, to those are yes. Um, so that's nice and easy. And you'll also be able, uh, um, you'll also be able to find on Adam's, um, on this page, Adam's funder mapping lookup. Um, and um, on the next slide, Amanda, um, I know that you have put uh, loads of really useful uh, resources for, for people to check. Yes, thank you, Adam, for posting the um, the link. Thank you, and that's it for me. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Fabienne. Um, so yes, we're doing doing really well on time, and I see that there's uh, plenty of uh, conversation going on in the chat. Um, would anyone like to ask a question? Okay, great. Um, one thing I guess I, um, I would ask about is that um, I know, I'd be sort of curious, we, we heard such a, um, some great 
discussion from from Jackson about curation of Chinese organizations. I'm wondering if there are any other areas that people think are priority um, regional records uh, that should take some curation attention. Anybody have any ideas about about that? Yeah, and so for some additional context, um, although it's not visible in a presentation today, we have actually had a lot of regional engagement um, from places like Brazil and some other countries in Latin America. Obviously, France is making a lot of moves towards open science, and they're very actively engaged with war curation. Um, We've worked previously with the Japanese government on improving our coverage and are still doing more of that this year. But yeah, I'd be interested if anyone knows of initiatives or work, um, you know, that we could kind of connect up with and focus um, on for work curation. So I'd be interested to hear about that. I would also be interested to hear from anybody. Um, we did hear such a lot about um, version two of Roar. Um, who here is currently using version one and is planning sooner rather than later to switch over to version two. Anyone? Yes, Audrey. Yeah, yes, uh, we are currently using version one at Dryad and uh, we have a, a ticket in the next two weeks to, to test version two um, and you know uh, see what changes we need to make in order to run our updating scripts and things um, with V2. Um, although when we'll actually make the permanent switch will probably be when it V2 goes into production and is um, updated uh, regularly. As someone said in the chat that it isn't currently um, updated automatically. It's That's not right. that I will update with the latest dump a few minutes yeah. <laughs> after this meeting. Uh, for the next, uh, for, for the production release, it will be updated at the same, at exactly the same time. I think it's the same for class to go. We will probably wait a few months, uh, but I'm sure we'll update to V2 this year. Right. And for those who don't know, Corey Shires is uh, one of the co-founders of Scholastica, um, which is a fantastic service provider that um, made a priority of our adoption. So yeah. Yeah, and I think it's wise for people to, uh, um, you know, do quite a bit of testing um, beforehand. So we're we're anticipating that as well. Um, Michael Anderson is asking a, a question in the chat. What is your aim with the language populating of the names and records? Is it to have 100% coverage and make it mandatory for new records? So Adam, can you maybe speak to that? Yeah, so we've done a lot of initial testing around this, comparing a lot of different language detection libraries. And essentially by synthesizing the results of a couple of different ones, we found that we can uh, detect languages for name metadata, um, as I said previously at about 97% accuracy for 80% of the existing name metadata. Um, I have a repo that I can link maybe in a second uh, with the language test data. So our aim is essentially to do that for the backfill um, where we're gonna try and get 80% of names um, at, that, at that level of accuracy. We'll obviously do some additional quality checks to make sure that um, you know nothing's gone awry relative to our sample data with the entire scale of the registry. Uh, but I think that that would be immediately useful um, you know, for, for people who want to move over to V2 and make use of those language tagging. Moving forward, um, yeah, we have some new automated tooling that essentially uses the same logic as the backfill to do language tagging for new record requests. So we don't actually, uh, users are obviously free to submit the languages of name metadata um, in the records, but we'll essentially be doing that as it's coming in. You know, we'll just essentially take it, run it through our automated processes. Everything also has human double checks. So we'll make sure that the languages are assigned. Um, and then as we publish records in V2, they'll all be language tagged. Um, there might be some exceptions if something's ambiguous or um, you know, just uh, something changes <laughs> uh, where there's not a name tag. But yes, our goal is to be as complete and possible for new and update records in terms of representing languages. Yeah, with and the I caveat that language code is not required um, by the by the schema. Yes, that's true. So uh, just strictly looking at the schema, it should not be expected by your your application by your integration that it always be populated because it's not a required field right and i think we had had um there was that little sort of naughty issue about the fact that some names of organizations have no detectable language is that right yeah there are things with so family names for instance are 
not really in a language and those may remain without uh, with null language codes. Uh, does that answer your question, Michael? Yeah, thank you very much. Great. Yeah, Great. Arthur has another uh, curation related question, which is um, regional affiliated colleges um, in India, of which there is a not, of which there are many. Um, yeah, so for some reason, GRID didn't seem to want to add a lot of um, affiliated colleges that are affiliated to Indian universities, even though they have extensive um, research outputs and, you know, kind of other publishing activities. I don't know their logic or rationale for that, but we add them as they come in and get flagged to us, you know, through the curation process. Um, I know that you have, we have an outstanding project from you based on APS data, which we will be getting to once um, the schema version two set that includes a lot of those. But yes, um, those autonomous affiliated uh, or autonomous colleges that are affiliated to universities are in scope for ROAR and we add them whenever they're flagged. Yeah, I was just wondering if it would make sense to have a project to do that more systematically, but uh, but uh, yeah, <laughs> that's fine. Yeah, I would. We would probably need a regional partner in India, and I'm trying to think if we've been in touch with anyone to help us identify that because a lot of them are sometimes managed through regional authorities versus at the federal level. Um, so that's that's some of the challenge. I did have one call with. Um a couple of people from an Indian organization um, a few months ago, and they had expressed interest in having sort of more of an informational webinar on ROAR um, sometime this spring or summer. So we can look back into getting back in touch with them about that. Yeah, that would be a good start probably. Yep, yep. And then I'm also curious as to um, who on the call is currently using the funder registry and what your plans might be for um, switching to Roar. So Arthur, yeah, I'd love to hear about what you're doing with the funder registry right now. Yeah. Uh, so we, um, all the uh, acknowledgements in our published articles are supposed to be tagged with funder registry IDs and that should be going to Crossref. So yeah, I mean, we have no current plan to switch it to Roar, except that we're aware that it's uh, something that will, will happen. Uh, and I'm good with that. That's great. <laughs> uh, there's definitely, uh, you know, some issues with the fund registry as it currently is. So um, I think it'd be helpful. Yeah. I I'm just curious, it, does that happen at like the typesetting stage? Do sort yes. of production right. editors come in and manually more or less assign the funder ID to text funding acknowledgements at APS? Yeah, it's basically, yeah, we don't do it at the... Uh, at uh, initial submission time, it's something that's done late in yeah. the process. Right, interesting. Uh, we yeah. we have a similar similar thing in Scholastica. Um, we collect it at we do collect it at submission, or at least give journals the option to collect it at manuscript submission. Um, and then also the editors can add it at any point uh, through the production process, peer reviewed production process. But um, same deal. We're using funder registry. I'm sure we don't. I don't think we really have a plan, but I'm sure we'll update probably this year. Right. Oh, and I guess one other thing, uh, it has been shockingly little used to me, uh, or just very few manuscripts authors are providing this information, which is a bit surprising, but I'm glad it's there as an option nonetheless. Mm. Yeah, so um, to follow from Corey and Arthur's comment, uh, part of what we'll be building um, in collaboration with Crossref is funder matching that's kind of based on um, parsing acknowledgements into funding statements, which we know is actually kind of the source of a large percentage of the existing um, existing kind of uh, data that exists in Crossref is parsed by essentially tools that publishers have. And so we want to kind of make an open version of that that can kind of parse out the funding statement into actual um, individual organizations and associated ROAR IDs. So that's something that we're working on. Um, that's still very greenfield, but it's in progress. Okay. Um, well, we're four minutes before the top of the hour. Anything else anyone wants to raise before we sign off until May? All right. Thank you all so much for attending. We'll see you in another call. Oh, I see something from uh, from John, but John will uh, maybe reply to this offline. Okay. Take care. Bye bye.
Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Oops.